Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome online. Thank you for joining us today in the T Chat, Futurizing Your Business Renaissance from the Age of Digitalization. Now get prepared, and we will set off to an inspirational journey with our futurist, Gerd Leonard, very soon. So uh, stay tuned, stay online with us, and I'll see you in a bit. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to T-Chat, Futurizing Your Business, Renaissance from the Age of Digitalization. My name is Vivek Mahubani. I'm your MC, moderator, and just like you, a curious mind as well. Now, thank you so much for joining us online today from Hong Kong and all over the world. Now, during the session, though, all of you are welcome to raise questions in the Q&A box right next to the live broadcast video frame. Selected questions will be asked later on in the session. We do look forward to hearing from you. Now, for our audience viewing on YouTube, though, make sure you go to the link listed in the comments section if you want to ask any questions. So today, for the very first time in E-Day history, we have invited the renowned futurist speaker Gerd Leonard, who is now in Switzerland, to lead us on an inspiring journey to discover megatrends in the future of business. Over the past two decades, Gerd Leonard has risen to one of the top 10 futurist keynote speakers worldwide. He has performed at over 1,500 engagements in 50 plus countries and boasts a global audience of over 2.5 million people. Gerd has written five books, including the best selling Technology vs. Humanity, published in 2016, now available in 10 languages. Now, before we meet Gerd, though, let's see what Gerd thinks about the interaction of AI and human in the future. We are at a pivot point in history. Humanity will change more in the next 20 years than in the 300 years before. Technology is now the defining factor of our society. We will be able to travel virtually to the most amazing places directly from our living room or using our mobile devices. Billions of devices and objects will be connected in the Internet of Things. Soon, technology is moving inside of us, becoming a part of us. Our contact lenses will be connected to the Internet, and nanobots will be in our bloodstreams, fixing our cholesterol. Life will be magical, abundant, full of possibilities. What could be better? Because we know, don't we, that what makes us human will never change. I know what you're thinking. Connectivity is like oxygen. We need it to live. Even at the price of losing our privacy? Your connected car, your smart fridge, your wearables will talk to your doctor and your insurance company. Yes, indeed, data is the new oil. These exponential changes are unstoppable. Man and machine will converge. We are about to transcend humanity. Is it creepy or useful? Is it heaven or is it hell? What will it mean to be human in a world where everyone will need to be amplified or augmented by algorithms? By 2027, computers are likely to match the capacity of the human brain perhaps even reach some kind of awareness or emotional intelligence. Yes, artificial intelligence and cognitive computing are incredibly powerful. But if we fail to consider the unintended consequences, such as, for example, an intelligence explosion, these advances could be more dangerous than nuclear weapons. Why would we expect robots or artificial intelligence to share or even understand human values, ethics and emotions. Technology doesn't have ethics, but the future of humanity depends on it. We need to spend just as much time on the norms and the values and the context than we spend on technology itself. After all, the future is not just something that happens to us, the future is something that we create. Are you ready for your future shock? 
Come with me and see where the story takes us next. Sounds fascinating, doesn't it? Now, I for one cannot wait to hear what Gerd has to say. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Gerd Leonard. Hey, Gerd. Greetings, Lei Ho. Hey, Lei Ho. Oh, look at you. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome. So it's good to have you here today. And uh, Gerd, you, you, you're a futurist. Actually, I'm curious. What exactly is a futurist? Could you just let us know? Well, it's all about Mayloy, right? <laughs> no, oh. I'm just kidding. Now, it's it's uh, to be a to be a futurist really is not about predicting, or about knowing the future. Uh, it's really developing a feel about what is coming and connecting it what, with what is happening. So it's it's not like I, I have a crystal ball, and it's more like I have a hunch, an intuition from my research and my conversations with people about what's coming. I always say I'm coming back from the future, you know, because I've researched things and looked at things, and that's really what I do. It's not really about understanding what's going to happen for sure, but to have an intuition and to get what's called foresights. So would you say pretty much anyone can be a futurist if they're curious enough and they're ready to go dive into the, what's that, what lies ahead? I, I would say pretty much anyone. I mean, I think there's a certain talent of, uh, you know, detaching yourself from now and looking at the future. That can be practiced. But, yeah, I think that that's a talent that most people have. It's just that we spend our lives you know, 150% focused on what is happening today, you know, but, but basically the future is arriving much faster than we thought. So understanding the future and understanding foresight as an entrepreneur, for example, is absolutely crucial because you're talking about, you know, three to five years from now, not 50 years. Oh, right, there you go. Well, I tell you what, speaking of the future, I'm going to give the future amount of time to you. So take it away, Gerd, and let us know more. All right. Thanks very much. So, um, the way I'm presented today is something I've worked out in the last six months in this COVID crisis is uh, using virtual background. So I hope you enjoy the show. Uh, and the difference is that I'm, I'm not using a presentation mode. I'm using more of a, a weatherman approach, I call it. Right? So let's dive right in. Uh, first, right, when we talk about the future, we should not be asking the good old question, what does the future bring? You know, that future, that question is not very fruitful because right now, for example, is a totally uncertain time. Nobody knows the future. Nobody predicted Donald Trump or the Brexit or, or of course, the epidemic, right? And the question we have to ask really is not what we can have, but what we want to have, right? I mean, we know, of course, for a fact that technology is now so powerful that pretty much anything we want can be achieved. I mean, this is not a secret that we're at the cusp of exponential change. So if you're an entrepreneur today, you think in five years from now, the, the sky is the limit. Right? Quantum computing, 5G networks, 10 billion people on the Internet, or 9 billion is the official number in 2030. Right? So basically, the, the question we should be asking is not what's going to happen. Uh, because what, we, what do we want to make? Right? That is the key question. The, so as an entrepreneur, and, and generally speaking, I think we need to ask the question, what kind of world do we want to create? And what kind of priorities do we have? And how will that benefit society in, in a larger way? Because I'm convinced that you know, the key to making money and to be successful is to have benefits across all of the components of what we want to achieve. You know, people, planet, purpose, prosperity, all four of those. Very, very important, especially today because of the COVID crisis, which I'll show you shortly or shortly what that means. I think we can safely say that the last six months have, month have been a complete program change in, in so many ways. I mean, the things that we thought were impossible are now just normal. I mean, in Europe, for example, the state is telling us what to do. I mean, we get money from the state, yes, but the state is dictating when we can leave, when we have to stay at home. Uh, it's a total change of program in so many ways. Working from home, for example, I think most of you are working from home. <laughs> That's what we're doing now. Huge shift can be great, can be not so great. But I mean, everything that we have thought wasn't possible is, is now all of a sudden here. Right? So this is a total reset. It is also a very difficult time in so many ways. I mean, let's 
let me impress some empathy about everyone who is currently in a situation that is tough because of loss of jobs and loss of social contact, especially older people, right? Where So there's many interesting good things, which I'll talk about, but there's also significant hardship where we have to have solidarity with each other and where we have to show compassion. This is very, very important, I think, on a global level to get over this crisis. So I call this the Corona Coaster. In fact, I, I got this from a great article at the in The Economist that talks about special words being invented now. <laughs> and one of them is the Corona Coaster, the roller coaster of feelings. I mean, I'm sure you're with me on this one, right? Sometimes it's like, oh, it's not so bad. And sometimes it's like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. It's like total dismay and little dismay and relaxation and all of a sudden great uh, uh, fear and anxiety. So this is the, the key for us. We have to help each other get through this corona coaster, which isn't going away anytime soon. Right? So basically, there is no return to normal as we had anticipated three months ago. I think this is the new normal. That's why I stopped saying the post-corona future. It is really kind of a with-corona future. Uh, and, and I think post-corona will be after the vaccine, and even that will have new challenges. So we have to get used to this roller coaster to help each other. Very important to kick this conversation off, especially if you're an entrepreneur. Milton Friedman, who I don't usually quote, is a very conservative economist, of course, right? but a great quote here where he says, only a crisis, whether it's actual or real, or I mean perceived, right, causes real change. And when that change happens and the crisis happens, it's important to see what kind of ideas are lying around. And this is our opportunity to review the ideas that are lying around. Climate change, right? new kinds of energy, a new emphasis on healthcare, right? new emphasis on technology, of course. I mean, all these ideas are lying around and let's make sure we pick up and we don't waste this opportunity. This is truly an amazing reset opportunity. It is a gigantic challenge, like, you know, for example, in my work, I used to go 100 times a year, fly places. You know, I think I flew 350 times in 2019, you know, sometimes four times a day in Europe, small flights, but crazy. And now it's just this. I'm talking to you through this green light. That's a whole different world out there. So I call this time that we're in right now the great transformation. This is not a great depression, even though it can feel like it, economically speaking. I can tell you I can sympathize with you on this one. Uh, but it's a great transformation of everything that we thought about, everything that has become normal all of a sudden, reset time. The World Economic Forum calls this the Great Reset, which I think are you know, very similar. I think this is a crisis, but it's also an opportunity. Basically, what's happening is the things that used to be important on top of this, this little uh, globe here, they're being reshuffled. All of a sudden, different things are on the top, right? Government, technology, healthcare, right? research. People are believing in science again. Even Americans are believing in science again. Well, maybe not the government, but in so many ways, you know, science has moved to the foreground now. And, you know, Bill Gates kind of predicted the pandemic like this, I know, seven years ago. So basically what we have now is this huge reset moment. And if you're an entrepreneur, you cannot get around this point of saying, what am I going to do to address these issues? Those are big opportunities. And what does the world look like you know, if we resolve and when we resolve this issue, right? So, four things here, right? the, uh, the corona cradle, <laughs> you know, it's basically four things that are happening, big tech, big media, big state, and big health. That's the primary outcome of this current crisis. Technology is everywhere. Without technology, we, we wouldn't be working from home. Without technology, we couldn't find new ways to address the crisis. We couldn't analyze all the data. Without AI, we couldn't have early warning systems like we had, for example, with Blue Dot, uh, the AI showing what is possible to kind of anticipate a crisis. Right? Without the state, we couldn't figure out how to restart the economy. We couldn't support people. I mean, state is now everywhere, and this is not new in some ways, but uh, big state is now growing everywhere, telling us what to do and how to keep the rules and so on. And of course, big health. I mean, healthcare is moving up and now becoming the number one issue. This is not the only pandemic we're going to see. We're, we're going to have to put more money. We're going to have to put more research. We're going to have put hundreds of trillions of dollars and uh, you know, any currency in the world is going to go into 
healthcare development, um, biotechnology. The money is shifting out of oil and gas and, and, and the military and banking you know, into healthcare, into technology, and of course, media. Right? We all are addicted to media now because we're, we're at home, right? The big media is you know, it's exploding. So those four things together, huge opportunities there, huge shift of money away from what uh, used to matter. I mean, for example, the whole Bitcoin and blockchain discussion, it's still very big, but it's now a subsection of everything else. Yeah, it's, not, it's not something that is entirely by itself. And I'll show in a second what, what's coming here. So in my view, this is what I call hell then, right? Heaven and hell. It could be heaven, or it could be hell. And this is primarily about how far do we go with this? And do we change things that make us human? And do we make them subject to different rules that are really only emergency rules? And, and this is, of course, very complicated societally, politically, and, and many other ways, where we have to make sure that we don't overdo it, right? <laughs> that we stay mostly in the heaven part of technology. Like social media has in so many ways become hell, right? Uh, and this is, yeah, it's, it's a huge debate about how we can prevent this and how we can change this. So I'm going to dive in a little bit. And first, I'm going to start by saying I think we have to get used to the fact we're dealing with utter uncertainty, and that is our future. That is the future where everything is subject to change, everything is ambiguous, everything is being, there, there is no certainty in our future, I think, until we figure out how we solve some of those major problems. Uh, I mean, if you're looking at this chart, I'm going to take myself out so you can see it better here. Right? This is basically, uh, this is what's happening. The GDP growth in the world is uncertain if it's going to be a V curve or an S curve or, you know, is it going to go up and down and come back? It's unknown. Right? There's, a, there's question marks there. And my view is that it's probably going to be more of a, an L shape. Right? So going down, going down, staying down. Right? Uh, and I think it's quite clear that when we look at this, it's like uh, the combination of those things. Yeah, the future has never been as certain as, is, as it is today. Oh, I'm certain, sorry. <laughs> I'm hoping for it to come become more certain. So, yeah, this is... We don't know the answer to this, so we have to assume that we have we are challenged. Right? So, uh, in the military, they call this VUCA, right? Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, and this is normal in certain circumstances. But now it has become our normal. Right? We are essentially living in a VUCA world. And that was already quite true before because of geopolitical and other changes, but now because of the pandemic, it's especially true. And, uh, and I think we really have to think about what that means for us and how do we react. I call this flipping the VUCA, you know, changing uh, the, the approach, especially if you're an entrepreneur, this is what we have to do. Right? We have to respond and say, okay, it's uncertain, but we can respond with speed, velocity. We can res respond with unorthodoxy, coming up with new stuff. For me, the ma master of unorthodoxy is Richard Branson. Right? Uh, and it's so, so many examples of how you do exactly the opposite than expected. Co-creation, working together. This is not a world that we can solve by ourselves. It's a world that needs us together, right? an ecosystem of services. And good old American world, which I think is a great fit now. Awesomeness. Creating stuff that really makes a difference. That's kind of the recipe, I think, for, for entrepreneurship now, to, to flip the VUCA, to turn around this, this threat and this constantly feeling uprooted. We have to get used to this. If you have kids, you've got to think about that. Yeah? What do your kids need to do to thrive in such a future? What kind of skills do they need? Do they need just an MBA or a degree in engineering? Or do they need more human skills? I, I think, yes, that's true. I'll talk about that in a second. Our kids are going to need to figure out how to stand up to this, right? how to invent. This is so crucial because the future is not going to go back to normal. Whatever normal was you know, two years ago, we're not going back there. Right? We are going into a different future. I think that's primarily a good thing, even though it may be hard to understand now. But... We're going to a future that's completely different. Uh, in fact, uh, this, uh, this illustration shows it pretty well. You know, we are pivoting. I mean, think about this. If you're an airline, how are you going to survive in the future? You're not going to grow 7 8 10% a year like, like before. It's, it's a different world now. 
You have to pivot. I personally believe I'm going to go to Zurich to my, to my airport, and I'm going to hop on the flight of Swiss Air. Without flying, I will hop into a virtual reality or hologram setup, and I'll pay $200 to go to Beijing for a seminar. That's coming, right? I mean, clearly, yeah, it's about pivoting. I'm going to show you some examples about what I mean with pivoting. But basically, this is our new reality now. And to my view, this is a great opportunity for entrepreneurs helping people pivot their model. Of course, pivoting your own model as well, uh, which can be rather tough. Here's an example. In the concert business, right? live concerts, now around the world, it's drive-through concerts. <laughs> I mean, I don't know wh where the fun with that is, but, you know, people seem to like it. It's very popular in Denmark and also coming in the U.S. Uh, and, of course, this is Saturday Night Live with Tom Hanks, produced from home. I mean, these are TV shows made from home. I think it's going to happen all over the world, especially in China, though, is producing your own things virtually. This is a completely different cup of tea, just like we're doing now. This is uh, this is the future. We're, we're going to continue to meet if we can, but clearly this is a big part of the future. And this is the Tour de France, if you want to do cycling. This year it happened in virtual reality. And, and the, the people were actually at home, the contestants, you know, the, the bikers were actually at home on a huge 10,000 euro machine. I think it's a lot more than that, but, you know, participating in the virtual, this is kind of like a game. Uh, and it was quite successful. What I hear, people really enjoyed the virtual Tour de France, right? Uh, and here's a great company called Zephyr that is figuring out, talk about airlines, uh, figuring out how to go. Uh, keep social distancing, keep people safe and economy by essentially creating a double decker setup. <laughs> I mean, talking about adapting, uh, pivoting, changing. This is what we have to do. It's an amazing opportunity. It's also challenging because, yeah, it's been tried for a long time. Here's a company from, uh, from Lisbon, from Portugal, that make a 3D printed uh, uh, inhalator, right? a ventilator. I mean, stuff that we need now, 3D printed ventilator. I mean, think about these kind of ideas for the future uh, that will uh, come in handy. And, of course, more funny examples like uh, this in ingenious man hugging his grandmother through a plastic curtain. <laughs> and, of course, you know, here's a, a French... Uh, a French proposal about, uh, you know, having a helmet that covers you completely. Uh, yeah, you know, different people have different views on this, obviously, as to what that pivoting look, could look like. So let me go back and say, okay, what is actually happening in technology now and what are the game changes? And it's interesting when you look at this, you can say that all of those game changes, which, by the way, you can find online. If you just go to uh, Gerd's Game Changers, just look for that, and you'll find plenty of things. Um, all of those things are accelerated by COVID. It's like it's like the, the corona crisis is like a giant warp drive. You know, you hit the button, and, and we go off to change land. Uh, and some businesses will probably never recover from it, like cruise ships. I mean, I, mean, I yeah, that's, that's going to be tough, right? <laughs> And other business like tourism, well, there's new ways of doing things. But, you know, this is basically a giant accelerator. So here are the game changes. And um, let me take myself out of the picture a little bit so you can see them better. So when you think about this, these are 10, but there are actually quite a few more. But let's go through them. You know, data, everything is about data. Data is the new oil. Data is the powerful uh, engine that drives a society. You know, especially, of course, there's... Lots of startups in that regard, and, and uh, in Hong Kong, but also you know all over the world and uh, in many many places that are dealing with data and of course cloud computing. Uh, the next one is connected everything, the Internet of Things. Uh, this is becoming the new normal. Hundreds of trillions of devices connected in ten years. Quantum computing, supercomputing. You've heard all about that. It's quite clear. We're going to have machines that are virtually unlimited in computing power. Natural language processing. I'm a great fan of that. I think this is going to happen so quickly. I can speak to the machine as if it was human. Right? So I can say, hey, you know, fix my focus here on this video, and it will just do it. It will just know what to do. Uh, and that's not far away. You know, language translation already working really well. Yeah, that's all coming. And smart everything, I would rather not call it artificial intelligence. I'll talk more about that later. This is really about smart machines, uh, smart in the machine sense, not in the human sense. <laughs> uh, transact everything, blo the blockchain, cover that later as well. 3D printing, 
I mean, for shipping, for example, are we going to ship plastic products? No, we're going to print them on demand. We're going to print our tennis shoes. We're going to bring, uh, print our wristwatches. We're going to, I mean, this is already happening in the medical business, print our kneecaps, you know, print our earlobes, even uh, mind-boggling changes, yeah. Seeing everything, virtual reality, mixed reality, clearly the crisis now, working from home and being at home, makes that the new normal. And the final one is uh, genetic engineering. CRISPR Cas9, of course, there's a huge debate about the ethical implications of this. But these are the 10 game changes. And basically what's happening with those is that they're all mixed up in, in, in a hyperdrive where scientists are topping each other to develop new solutions. I mean, truly, th these are exponential times. So, uh, Kai Fu Lee, one of the key investors in artificial intelligence, always talks about how these are, are sort of uh, 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 converging trends and, and also creating combinatory results. So it's not just exponential. It's, it's basically super hyperdrive, uh, exponential, combinatorial, convergent, all on top of each other. So the next 10 years will bring more change than the previous 100 years. Uh, we're going to see so many amazing opportunities and also, of course, many challenges. How far do we go? Who is in charge? Right? Which leads me to my next topic, the mega shifts. And by the way, uh, this is chapter three in my book, uh, Technology versus Humanity. But you can download it for free at megashifts.digital. Also in Chinese, I think that's going to be Mandarin Chinese, but but uh, in, in like 14 languages. So the mega shifts are a concoction of different trends, including cognification. You know, machines are getting smart, not smart like us, you know, very big asterisk, but they are able to recognize patterns. You know, they, they can sort of anticipate what's going to happen next from those patterns, but they're still not intuitive. They don't have human agency, obviously, <laughs> but virtualizing systems like digital twins, and I mean, this is happening everywhere, virtualizing jobs, virtualizing healthcare, remote diagnostics if you're in a pharma business. I mean, mind-boggling possibilities here by virtualization and also a huge threat to employment, of course, that we have to think about. Robotization or robots are going to be everywhere, and this is very big, of course, in China in general already, but yeah, robots are going to be absolutely everywhere, maybe not in the street greeting us, but doing jobs, whether they are software or hardware robots, you know, augmenting us, seeing virtual reality, uh, digital uh, mixed reality, HoloLens, yeah, especially now, like, you know, what we're doing now with Zoom is pretty cool, but think about that five years from now, it, it's going to be like Star Trek. I mean, it's automation, yeah, that's the number one driving force behind the discussion about the future of work, which I want to dive into now. So looking at the mega shifts, please do read the, the chapter megashifts.digital in 10 languages. You can download the whole PDF there. So here's the important part. This technology, these technologies can be a present, but they can also be a bomb. Right? They could do amazing good things and they can do things that are not so good. Uh, for example, look at social media, right? election manipulation, uh, all the discussion about what social media does and what it, what it should do, what it should not do. Uh, Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, once said, technology can do great things, but it does not want to do great things. It doesn't want anything. It's just technology. It's a tool. It's like a hammer. Right? So this is going to be important uh, when we think about this. Too much of a good thing can be a very bad thing. Too much technology is just too much technology, and then it and then it's hurtful. This is like you know alcohol or smoking. Too much of a good thing is a very bad thing. You don't drink fifty cups of coffee per day. Probably would be a fairly bad thing, uh, but I would certainly appreciate one now. But anyway, this is something to think about, right? So uh, we have to have rules as to what you know what what is good enough and what is too far. You know, precautionary and proactive at the same time. Um, yeah, that's not going to be easy. We have to discuss and also find global arrangements. So that brings me to AI. AI is driven by three very simple facts. Right? Data, 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 data. Uh, data is in your oil. That's kind of an old hat. I'll tell you why in a second. But yeah, data, everything is data now. You know, the environmental system is data. We are data. When we cross the street, it's data. Uh, face recognition, very, very big discussion about how far that should go. But all that data going into the cloud, I mean, imagine, for example, a healthcare cloud that actually works. My DNA, my biomes, my phenotype, my smart information, my mobile phone connected 
to a healthcare cloud could save millions, hundreds of millions of lives, but would also create significant security issues right? and, and many issues about access and control. And on top of that, now we have intelligent systems. And I would prefer to call this IA, intelligent assistance, rather than AI. Uh, basically, what's happening here is quite clear. These systems are not intelligent like humans. I mean, you should do, read Stuart Russell's latest book, Human Compatible. Stuart Russell is the world's leading professor on AI. He wrote, he wrote the uh, course book, number one course book on this. You should read his book and, and think further about this. I don't think at this point we have to worry about AI becoming like us or surpassing us. Maybe in 30 years, yeah, maybe. That's a different discussion. Right now it's about this right, intelligent assistant, intel, intelligent systems. And really what's happening here is this, this brain of zeros and ones uh, is very, very powerful. But, but humans don't think in zeros and ones. I mean, we are not zeros and ones. We don't answer just yes, no. I mean, think about every conversation you're going to have with friends or your wife or family. When do you ever say just yes, no, yes, no? We don't. Right? We say, well, it depends. Or I've changed my mind. Or I find another reason why I'm different now. Uh, this is not how humans work. This is how humans work, right? We are very quick with getting to the point without saying a single word, without analyzing the numbers. We understand because we have senses. We have 10 different kinds of intelligence. Uh, the the uh, researcher Gardner says, you know, emotional, kinesthetic, uh, intellectual, of course, mathematical, musical. Right? I mean, Intelligence is not just zeros and ones. Right? Great researcher Morovec says, whatever is easy for a human is hard for a machine and vice versa. And this will be true, I think, for at least 20 years. And when it's no longer true, then we have to think about that again. Right? But right now, the best possible world can be, in my view, to have really incredibly smart, powerful machines and add the human intelligence on top and then combine them, not substitute uh, the human intelligence. This is why I think humans should always be in the loop, even if it makes it slower, especially when it's about human decisions, like criminal justice or healthcare. You know, machines, smart machines, aren't going to replace humans unless the humans are like a machine. You know, like, for example, somebody is welding a car. You know, okay, so 98% of that could be routine. The machine can do it. But a doctor, a lawyer, a driver even, people will drive in self-driving cars, but they will not be like humans. They will not be like you can just talk to them and say, hey, you know, what do you think of the soccer result today? Uh, I mean, these are machines that just do routine things. So that, I think, is important. Let's, let's not forget and We should use technology. We should embrace technology, but we should not become technology. There, there is a vast difference here. This is a key message also, of course, in my book. So uh, to, to bring this into reality, um, if you take a look at artificial intelligence, right, clearly this is everywhere now where little devices are telling you what the weather is going to be, what street to use, where to go, uh, to give you alerts. I think it's pretty cool, all that things. But as we know, a language understanding uh, with computers, it can work pretty well. But as soon as you can deviate just a tiny bit from the from the core speaking and use some other words, it, it, goes, it goes crazy, right? So AI is useful. But let's make sure that we still keep the lid on and let's be careful with what we wish for, what the machines should decide. And I think this is going to be, I think everybody who understands artificial intelligence, you know, many scientists that I've talked to, yeah, this is also why we should have rules and why we should think about how far we go and who is supervising and, uh, you know, and, and you can already see clearly for the last two years, especially now uh, during the COVID crisis, we have come down to the reality of artificial intelligence. We have come down to saying, well, it's a great tool, it's not a miracle machine. Uh, AI did not warn us of the impending uh, corona crisis in the same way that we would have wished, even though there were some warnings. Maybe we didn't pay attention either. <laughs> but, you know, this is a human world. It's not a machine world. It doesn't follow simple rules. Huh? It's utterly complex and utterly sometimes non-rational. And this is a tough thing for machines. 
So really what we need to be careful of is, is this field in AI where it's about privacy, about diversity, about disclosure. Yeah, these are complex issues that machines can't really solve. And this is why we need compatible, human compatible AI, as Stuart Russell says. And this brings me to ethics, right? Uh, it's very important, no matter where you live, no matter what religious persuasion, and when I talk about ethics, I'm not talking about religion. I talk about human beings. I am not talking about anything above that or underneath this. Ethics is knowing the difference between what you have a right to do or the power and what is the right thing to do. Yeah, now you're going to say, well, how do we know what is the right thing to do? Well, this is subject to some little careful fine-tuning, but this is what it comes down to, right? Digital ethics is a huge topic now because it's about making technology human. Uh, example, uh, there's a global uh, boycott of Facebook uh, for advertising. I mean, this is, the, this is Unilever. They're saying they're going to stop advertising in the U.S. on Facebook, and hundreds of companies have followed them because Facebook is not guaranteeing the veracity and the truth of what's happening on their platform and actually, in my view, acting quite unethical about this uh, and not really changing the ways. I left Facebook as a, as a uh, user two years ago, but, but, but now the consequences are coming and many other people are saying we're going to stop advertising on, on Facebook and we're going to stop advertising on social media until we know that they're being responsible. Here's a question I have for you. Why is social media not responsible for what's happening? Just like the telecom companies and the banks and the oil companies, some of them, are being made responsible for what they are creating, what they're enabling. I mean, clearly this is a very, very big discussion that we're having in Europe. And what, what goes with that is the realization that data isn't just the oil, right? I mean, the oil is, yeah, could be positive, yeah, it could be, but it's also like, kind of like a plutonium. It's, it can be used as a weapon. And so we have to make sure that it's used in a good way. And if you're an entrepreneur, this is the number one question. How can your product be abused and what are you going to do about it? And that question wasn't a big question until five years ago. And now in the COVID crisis, it's all going to be about human benefit, societal benefit, problem solving, right? Practical things, survival, adaptation. It's all going to be about this very, very big change for us. Huh? So um, I think this is the paradox. Huh? Technology is morally neutral until we use it. It's just there. I mean, you can, you can take a hammer uh, and you can go kill somebody on the street or you can go uh, build a house. It's technology. Right? You can take AI and kill somebody. But really what we need is ethics to go on top as a layer, right? So that we are saying what is possible and what should be possible. And that will be subject to a lot of international discussions about, you know, how do we use it? How do we not use it? I mean, this is keenly a question of getting on the same page. I mean, imagine if we hadn't gotten on the same page with nuclear weapons, we, we wouldn't be sitting here today. And we've got to get on the same page when it's about the ethics of technology. Geoengineering, genetic engineering, right? uh, biotechnology, and of course, artificial intelligence, and of course, climate change, which I'll talk about in a minute. But So let's go to work and jobs. The, the message here is really quite clear on my view uh, that the end of routine is near. Right? I mean, technology is going to cover pretty much any routine. Machines are learning how to cover routines. Right? I mean, clearly, the end of routine is near, but the important part is, you know, anything that can be digitized or so will be. It's the end of routine. But ask yourself a question. How much of your work is routine? And I would say some of my work is routine, research, filing, checking, sending invoices. <laughs> yeah, but a lot of work, my work is not routine, and, and that is kind of a saving grace. I mean, if your work is 98% routine, then yes, a machine will take it. But driving a car isn't 98% routine. A lot of research has, for, as an example, a lot of research has shown that, that many, maybe 40, 50% of all jobs can be automated. But then the research also says only 5% can be completely automated. So there is a vast difference between routines. I think what we have to face is how do we get rid of the routine? How do we automate things that don't matter? How do we keep the things that matter? Right? I mean, clearly, this is the future, then the stats kind of clearly show this, right? World Economic Forum, 
uh, how machines will do the. I mean, it's actually optimistic, right? How many machines will do uh, the routine work? I mean, it's this is where we are going across the world. Uh, machines are learning routines like accounting, filing, invoicing, checking, uh, financial information, stock market operations. Uh, the future is a non-routine cognitive work and non-routine manual work. Non-routine manual, for example, would be carpenters, electricians, you know, craft people, therapists, cooks. Right. Uh, well, therapists do the cognitive work. Right? So all that, you see the two lines going up, it's quite clearly, if you have kids, that's the recipe, right? non-routine work. Right? Here's a, a chart of jobs. Bad news, if your job can be automated, it will be manufacturing, transportation, storage, public administration, financial, and on the top part, that's the new jobs, right? health, scientific, communications. And no surprise there, we are talking about the human jobs, right? the jobs that we do because we're human. We're not machines. We're not data engines. You know, we're 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 not just zeros and ones, and we're not algorithms. You know, some people have said in the past, you know, uh, that organisms are algorithms. I don't believe that. I think that may eventually turn out to be true in 50 years. That we can think that far right now. That's far from the from the future. So this problem. You know, many people talk to me about this, you know, that we're going to be useless humans. Well, yes, if you are like a machine, if you act like a machine, if you work like a robot, if you learn like a robot, if you behave like a robot, yes, your job becomes useless. But apart from that, you know, I mean, 100 years ago in many countries around the world, 90% of people work in agriculture. And now in many countries like Germany or the U.S. is less than 2%. Are we all unemployed? No, we're doing different things. Is that very likely to be our future, that some people will be unemployed? Yes, we have to cover them and take them in and, and up-train them. But the good news is this one. Right? Quite clearly, all of these skills, when you're looking at what humans do, right? emotions, creativity, compassion. Yeah, can a computer be compassionate? Well, you can fake it, yes. But can it have a mystery? Can it tell a story? Can a computer be creative? Yes, it can make music based on algorithms. But can a computer be truly creative? Clearly, this is something where we have to say, well, anything that cannot be digitized or automated becomes extremely valuable. And that's what we have to learn for ourselves. That's what our kids have to learn. Anything that machines can't do. So it's, it's quite separate from the IQ and the logic. Right? That's why I always say it's great if you're a STEM graduate, you know, science, technology, engineering, math. But in many ways, it's even greater if you are a better human, right? I call it hecky, humanity, ethics, creativity, imagination. Because even now that we're working from home, we're doing all this, we crave human relationship. This is what humans are until we change ourselves in our genetic makeup, which is, you know, being discussed, of course. But basically, it's all about relationships. It's not about data. It's not about technology. These are crutches. Human relationships matter more than ever, and this is really important when you think about customers, about inventing stuff. Look at this chart here. Well, I'll send it along later as a PDF, but clearly on the top of the pyramid, important and growing, right here, and what is it? Leadership, communication, negotiation, critical thinking, and right to next, next to that, advanced IT. It's, it's the same world, right? it's both. But our success will be defined how good of a human we can be. And Peter Drucker once said, you know, strategy, uh, uh, strat um, culture eats strategy for breakfast, I think is what he said. And I like to say culture eats technology for breakfast. This is about culture, about how we adopt, you know, what we want. And, and uh, this great philosopher and, and uh, therapist and psychologist, Martin Seligman said it's all about PERMA, right? Positivity, engagement, relationships, meaning, accomplishment. This is what we have to pursue when we launch a product. This is not just about efficiency and about solving technical problems. It's, it's a much larger role than that. And, you know, I did about a dozen startups, and I, some of them failed because of this, because we didn't really have that. Right? We didn't really go beyond that part. So uh, paradigm change, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up with a with a brief uh, 
conclusion. So, uh, paradigm change clearly right now, COVID-19, the crisis, is a test for climate emergency. Climate change and climate emergency is a thousand X of what we're experiencing right now. In fact, I think many rules that we have in place right now because of COVID will need similar rules to cover climate change. We've got to be prepared for this. If one thing has shown, the crisis has shown to us, if we must be prepared, we must be ready to act, we must trust science, we must invest in the right places, and above all, we must collaborate for global issues, and certainly climate change is one of those. I mean, clearly, we used to think that things like carbon taxes are impossible, and now we're talking about it. In Europe, we're talking about basically a tax for each airplane fight, flight that you may be taken. I think that's coming. We used to think of that as impossible. It's not. Nothing is impossible anymore because now we figure out if there's an emergency, out goes impossible. Right? Right. And all of a sudden it is possible. I mean, look at this stat. Uh, clearly shows you that people are pulling out their money from oil and gas. Uh, the end of oil is coming. Uh, and this is, of course, a, not just an economic issue, but it's a huge political and, and geopolitical issue. A conversation about what's going to happen next. So in the past, we had this kind of thinking about ego systems, what I call ego systems, you know, going back to the original Microsoft long time ago. Everything belongs to you, right? You run everything. And now it's not, right? You cannot run the world by yourself. You can't own everything. Even Apple can't own everything. They have to share and bring in others. It's, you know, this is the future. It's not ecosystem, it's ecosystems, right? And this is so important when you're an entrepreneur to understand you're going to create something that is a powerful mover in the ecosystem, but you can't own the ecosystem. This is something that, for example, Airbnb is now learning, right? You can't own that. You can collaborate to be important, but you can't own the ecosystem. And other companies like Salesforce have been very good at building their own ecosystem. But clearly, on the international level, you know, Alibaba, for example, is a giant ecosystem of, I don't know, 65 companies. So ecosystems is our future. So what now? This is the key question for the Mayloy for the future. So all these interesting things, but what are we going to do now? Let me give you a summary. First, the game changes are real and they're happening much quicker. Sometimes we'll think of we're on this highway of, of change and, and we're seeing AI and 3D printing left and right and we think, okay, you know, let's take a look. But the reality is that we're going into warp drive now, especially with COVID. That means all of a sudden it's like we're speeding up like crazy and things are getting really fast and not just a little fast. And, uh, things are going to get a lot faster <laughs> and the future is coming quicker, much, much, much quicker than we think. Again, The 10, next 10 years will bring more change than the previous 100 years. So here's the five-hour rule according to Bill Gates. He's talking about reading books, but I'm talking about spend one hour a day on your foresight skills, on your future skills, to navigate what's coming, to understand it, to play with scenarios. Clearly, that's going to be absolutely crucial uh, to survive in this future. The other thing is, you know, we have to get away from the old business model of the digital economy, whatever that was uh, some time ago, right? <laughs> to make things more convenient, more efficient. That's good. Right? But really what we want now is we want to create experiences. Uh, Pine and Gilman talked about this in a book, 1999, called The Experience Economy, and now it's here, right? It's all about creating powerful experiences. Think about the really most successful services in China. They've created entirely new experiences. Right? And, and this goes pretty much for all countries, for all uh, global international levels. Experiencing things is the priority for the human brain and then changing how you do it. For example, Spotify, my favorite example in music, right? Uh, it changed the way that I consume music. And, and now we have 120 million or so subscribers, 60 million songs, right? Experiences, transformations. Finally, I'll go back to what I said earlier. Great that we have intelligent machines, but let's, let's put that overlay on top, right? Purpose, curiosity, foresight, critical thinking, the things that humans do. That is more important than understanding if this zero goes over here or that one goes over there. Together, you know, it can create a really, really powerful scenario. This is our future, right? I mean, in a nutshell, right? intelligent systems, intelligent technology helping us to solve problems, and then the human things that we want that machines will never understand, never be, hopefully, 
and never should be, in my view, right, layered together. And I believe seriously that sometimes maybe we're, we're less efficient because we're more human, but it's okay because being inefficient is human, because having mystery is human, because not being completely red like, like a coat is human. So very important when you think about how to design your startup, humanity on top of technology, not under technology, not technology to technology, and then a little bit of humanity. <laughs> I mean, uh, technology is not what we seek, it's how we seek. What we seek, of course, yeah. You can answer that question, but generally speaking, happiness, of course. Right. So, going back to what I said at the beginning, what kind of future do you want? This is the question. The question is not what kind of future you can have. That may sometimes be the question in the process of getting to this, but right now it's about this question. In 10 years, what does the future look like? What do you want it to look like? And there are lots of ramifications about this and what that means. But I think right now we're really talking about four key points. Eh? Survival, that's key now. Safety, survival, financial planning, stability, that is crucial today. And that's what we're all doing, uh, adapting, pivoting our business model, coming up with new solutions, collaboration. The future of entrepreneurship is not about domination. It's not about what it was 15 years ago. It's about hyper-collaboration, hyper-speed, uh, and transforming society, transforming business. Clearly, that is the future I think that we should be looking up to. So I want to thank you very much for your time. And I, I know I covered lots of ground here, but uh, I figured I should let you know everything that I've thought of. So thanks for tuning in. We're going to have the video available and the audio, I think, and I, I will make a package with my slide. If you like my book, check out techversushuman.com uh, for further reading. Thanks very much for tuning in. Thank you so much, Gerd. Oh, eye-opening experience. Definitely a lot of things that have changed my mind as well. And I'm sure a lot of our online audience members have many questions. I can see the questions coming in already. So just to remind you, you can submit your questions in the little frame next to our video over here. And if you're watching on YouTube, go to the link in the comments so you can submit your questions as well. And with that, don't go anywhere, guys, because we're moving on into our long-awaited uh, dialogue section right now and it brings me a lot of delight to introduce our three special guests who are key startup community builders here in Hong Kong. So please join me in welcoming them one by one. We've got Miss Karina Bellin, co-founder of W Hub and Angel Hub. So you just look at the camera right over here and say hello to everybody. Make sure that we can hello see. There everybody. we go. That's Karina. Yes. Next to her, we've also got Dr. Toa Charm, Associate Professor of Practice in Management of CUHK Business School. Hi, everybody. All right, fantastic. And of course, we've got Mr. Herbert Chia, Venture Partner of Sequoia Capital China. Hi. And of course, we cannot leave, leave out Gerd, who's been with us so far. So Gerd, I hope you're still with us. Say hi to everyone and make sure that we can get this going because we've got the questions coming in, guys. And I definitely want to ask them away. So, Great, I'm still here. All right, fantastic, good. <laughs> oh, you changed your background. I like it. Oh, look at you, high tech. Oh, right. yeah. Now, people are talking <laughs> online. They're asking questions like work from home versus work from the office. How, how do you foresee this overall in the future? Uh, Corinna, like, how do, what do you think about the work from home versus work from office idea? Well, yeah, I think actually it's, it's very interesting. And a couple of um, you know, sectors like prop tech was already on the rise even before COVID, right? And uh, obviously it asks a lot of questions, asks a lot of questions in terms of ideal space, idle space you know, for companies, what do they do about it? Um, people are predicting that co-working spaces will be even further on the rise, more flexibility for um, you know, companies to decide how many manpower at what given point in time is necessary. Um, I think what, there, there are two things I think is really interesting to experience with work from home. Um, I think one is really um, a cultural change for companies that really need to ask themselves the questions, why do people now not come to the office, but tune in online and work self-motivated at home? And again, for us, you know, you know, W Hub stands for startup passion, and we always start with, with why, the passion, the purpose. I think it really will help purpose-driven companies you know, to excel even further. Um, I think the other thing that is obviously very interesting is also a shift in um, behavior and in attitudes, right? Um, so that is um, now nobody would argue it is a problem to hold a virtual conference, right? So there's a huge shift in understanding the need of being physically connected. And I think same as when the first time we introduced emojis, 
we didn't really connect a lot what this was here all about, but you know, the brain started becoming wired differently and really trigger emotions. And I start you know, feeling more emotional connectivity over Zoom than you know, I did before. I mean, we just finished a large online conference, fully online, fully digital. And I think last but not least, um, again, with that, with that behavior change, it will really also help and drive a lot of companies forward. So one of the companies um, you know, we're, we're currently supporting as well um, is in the gaming sector. And there they say, you know, now, great news, every day is a weekend now. So they really see huge shift and uptrend. So I think there are a lot of layers to that work from home, um, which are gonna be very, very interesting and, and changing uh, market dynamics and, and behavior. Well, I mean, you definitely hit a point. I mean, working from home, people used to feel like going to the office. Sometimes you got to deal with colleagues and everything, right? Mm -hmm. You got that dynamics. But working from home means your family are your colleagues, right? It's a completely different shift now, yeah. right? From nine to five, you're my colleague, honey. Like, you know, don't be my wife at the moment. You don't have a lot of those issues. What about yourself, uh, doctor? Uh, did you have a work from home experience? Or what do you think about this concept? Well, this concept is really great. I mean, the crisis, that means you have opportunity and also you have uh, challenges. I take the positive side because at school, people can make Zoom, actually can make, meet more people, right? Not only from Hong Kong or Macau or China, but around the whole world. From a startup perspective, I think when I look at all these startups, uh, deal with them for many, many years before and even now. So the most successful startup, actually, they have a diversity of teammates. Diversity meaning that they're coming from different countries. So I think before that, I think a lot of Hong Kong startups, they try to do things together with their classmates and friends in Hong Kong. But right now, because you see it passively or actively, they need to work it out. So I think it's a good opportunity to look at the market. They can actually develop the regional market. In the team's perspective, there's a good chance to build a diversity of teammates. Then they can actually tackle different markets, uh, actually leveraging on talents from different countries. I think this is a positive side, uh, out from work from home or study from home. Okay, well, I mean, work from home definitely has brought people closer. No more excuses of like, oh, you're overseas. You're as close to myself as the neighbor to someone else on another country. What about yourself, Herbert? Like, do you see work from home being the, the next thing in the future for normality? I think as an investor, right, I get used to uh, work everywhere. <laughs> Doesn't matter whether at home or even on a flight tour. Right? Usually I plan how to uh, work in, a plan, uh, in an airplane, you know, how to spend the one hour uh, reading books or anything, right? But uh, I think one, one thing that's quite different uh, uh, in the past in the, uh, to now is that uh, I heard that uh, even in China, there's not many people fly for business anymore. It's a bad news for the, um, the uh, air, air flight company, of course, but you know, it's good news for the efficiency. I remember that when I was uh, still in Ali, right, Alibaba, it's so hard to convince my colleague to not to fly from Hangzhou to Beijing for, <laughs> for a meeting. Because it uh, sounds like uh, if, the, I don't, uh, if I don't uh, approve for a ticket from Hangzhou to Beijing, they will not able to work. But now I don't think this is an excuse anymore. So I think this is actually just the beginning of uh, the new, um, the new uh, age. On, on this, but then I, I, I find that this one thing very uh, difficult is that uh, when you work at home, um, uh, uh, whereas you work in the uh, uh, office, right, the discipline is becoming much, much more important. Even for us who work for, in the office for a long time, right, you really need to have a discipline. Where that's what uh, human, right, uh, compare with the artificial intelligence because the artificial intelligence don't have a problem of being disciplined or a problem of having need to be passion for 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 your, what you work on. But but this is different because we're human. So under this situation, right? Even I today, I have to arrange what my daughter have to do in this few weeks because suddenly the summer holiday is coming earlier. <laughs> so so they just. Uh, Go crazy, you know, watching TV and all that. I don't, I'm, I don't mean watching TV is not is wrong, but just then they're watching TV everywhere because of the technology as well, right? But so you need to manage the time much better than before. And 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 if we talk about that with the um, uh, 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 innovator company, right? This is something that also has a business uh, opportunity there because human need to have. Uh, much better assistant on that. 
Yeah, that's, that's my view. No, I think if it's very true. Working from home has the one issue I find like when I'm at home, I've got so many new distractions. Suddenly I want to clean my desk. Suddenly I want to sweep the, sweep the kitchen, right? But when you're at the office, it's kind of focused. That's all you have. You've got to work with that. What about yourself, Gerd? I mean, you've been working from home for the last hour with the presentation. What do you think about this concept of working from home? Yeah, I mean, of course, that's been completely normal for myself for, for a long time. But I, I think what we have to face is that most people think in this sort of black and white way, right? Like working from home is good or it's bad. Right? But, but the reality is it, it can be amazing and it can be really bad. And, and some work is really badly done at home and other work is badly done in the office. You know? uh, and I think the reality is that we have to make sure that we find the right jobs to go in the right places but also uh, consider human nature, which is basically like, you know, for example, you, you can be at home, you can watch a hundred hours about what the, the night bazaar in Mumbai or in India looks like, right? And you have this intellectual understanding of it. But when you go inside of it in real time, right there, and you take two seconds of being in the market in Mumbai in real life, all of the learning of YouTube has been covered, erased, basically, or or combined, right? So it's kind of like I often compare working from home to dating, you know? You can do online dating, and it has a certain function. People obviously do it and like it. Uh, but then you still need to meet, you know, because we're human. So I think in the end, we should not underestimate. And this is why I wouldn't be so worried, for example, about real estate prices like in, in Hong Kong or any other city. I think we're going to see a correction. People are going to want to meet each other. We're going to see a lot of hybrid models, two days at home, three days in the office. It, human interaction remains important. Uh, but, you know, online systems will get so much better. I mean, what we have today is, is pretty good compared to 10 years ago. But in 10 years, like virtuality of being in virtual places is, is going to blow our mind. It's going to be like Spotify compared to CDs, you know. Uh, so let's be open for this, but let's not forget that real, the real connection between humans is not in that green light, you know. It's, it's in, a, in a physical way. I mean, this is why our kids are not happy when, when it's just video calls. Well, we have to go and hug them. That's just part of, you know, having a relationship. Well, I mean, like the idea of virtual reality, definitely, if, for example, my small apartment put on some goggles, I'm living in a mansion. That would be like a dream come true for a lot of us here in Hong Kong. Now, Gerd, you talked about health issues being on the top of the list of, you know, jobs and everything. What, what, what is the biggest problem that you foresee the world needs to tackle in the upcoming uh, 10 years, actually, apart from health issues? Well, I think it's quite clear that, you know, the, the problems that we're facing are also huge opportunities. Like, I think, for example renewable energy, you know, there's only 10 million people working in oil and gas uh, and nuclear. Uh, there's estimates saying sustainable energy, green energy, renewable energy of any kind, inclu including fusion, nuclear, and so on. We get 100 million jobs. Right? And so, and basically, we have global issues that we need to tackle together, and this goes for truly together, not in, in blocks, but all together. Climate change, <clears throat> technology, mm -hmm. um, food, water disease right? um, and and we are tech i mean these are all gigantic opportunities the question is where are we going to put our money right? and my hunch is we're going to take the money out of oil and gas we're going to take the money out of conventional military and we're going to put that into the sectors that will have huge enormous global benefit and that's where many startups will will operate and i mean clearly it's easy to see that now that we've learned what can happen if we're not prepared mm and we don't use data well enough, and we don't have collaboration, yeah, now we know that, yeah, we're better off to spend half a trillion now than to spend 10 trillion later. And, and, and this has been a great lesson, I think, for collaboration, for science. Uh, and I, I see mostly good things coming out of it, ex except for, of course, the next two or three years, which, which will be a challenge for many of us. So a lot of resource allocation would be issues that you have to think about. I mean, Herbert, yourself, I mean, if, are you thinking resource allocation is the biggest issue you're going to have to deal with in the future? Yeah, I think so. But uh, uh, in terms of the uh, startup, we're actually talking about two, two, uh, at least two kinds of uh, startup. One is that uh, they are directly facing to the uh, consumer. There's another uh, uh, startup, which is uh, they are in the middle, right? They are providing tools for other companies right, to work uh, to uh, solve the uh, problem of the human. So it's very different because the first one is much easier for them to find uh, what kind of problem they are solving in, in, in short terms. 
But the others, uh, for an enterprise solution uh, company, right, it's much harder for them to see uh, what kind of problem am I solving because I'm providing tools. You know, I'm providing tools for the company to work better. So um, I, 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 in terms of that, right, it's much, uh, e uh, I mean, it's easy, it's easy to forget about, you know, there's some technology that we should, uh, we should develop for the uh, future, especially on, on this kind of moment. Uh, for example, like, uh, we are all relying on data, data, and data. And then we, since we see that there's not many companies are working on data security uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a better manner right, for, uh, for the privacy issue. So, so those are the company uh, that uh, we usually lack of the vision on or what, what, what they're doing, you know? Also that when we relying on internet uh, all the way, but at home, right? Did you realize that uh, your uh, router has been attacked a uh, few thousand times every day, <laughs> right? And then it's hacked already, but you didn't know that, right? So that's uh, when we're so relying on something mm -hmm. that then there should be something to protect against that uh, something had been shifted where we didn't really, uh, uh, we didn't re realize that it's very fast, in a very fast uh, speed. I mean, it, it, you're very true. I mean, data security is an issue. I still have friends whose password is password with an exclamation mark. <laughs> I, I don't understand what year are we in, right? <laughs> but well, what about you guys? What do you think is going to be the biggest issue? Dr. Chan, what do you think like in the next 10 years is well, going to be that big issue? I, I have a, a real story to tell. I think this opened the door for many of us uh, in the technology field. Uh, you know, the, in Asia, many rich people are actually work for their family, conglomerate. They make a lot of money, they never open the door for any technologies because I'm making a lot of money already. Why I need to spend on technologies? That remind me, uh, about 20 years ago, when we went to uh, Macau, go to see Stanley Ho, and whether you need any machines or anything technology, and his answer was no. Because I'm making a lot of money, why I need to spend one more dollar to spend on technologies? When more and more casinos go to Macau, they will buy a lot of technologies because of competition. For this crisis, I think it's very similar. Uh, all the Asian conglomerate, now they open up the door. Okay, I don't know about this, but I need it because my shopping mall, my hotel, my property, nobody buy it from us now. So they open up the door. I think it's a golden opportunity for all of us, startups, uh, technology company, enablers like incubators, accelerators. It's a good news for us. I, I give you a very good joke. Uh, one of the Asian largest conglomerate asked me one question, a CEO. What is hackathon? Is it somebody to hack our system? Then I don't want this. You see how far the gap is. Yeah. But they need it right now. So I think it's a very good, good opportunity for all of us to work on that. So. I mean, it's very true. I mean, the yeah. whole concept that if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? But sometimes you have to be innovative because it, it's, it's not broken, but it needs to change as well with the times. That's yeah. the challenge. And it's very true. A lot of people, it, it works for me, so I don't want to think about anything different. Why change it? Karina, do you see a lot of this, especially in the startup culture, that people are coming up with new ideas or trying to find ways to convince old minds to change their mindset as well? Yeah, of course. It's just funny because we just closed a 36-hour online hackathon for one of the biggest <laughs> conglomerates here in Hong Kong for Jardins, uh, Matheson, with 10 different challenges. And I always say, you know, seeing is believing. You don't learn entrepreneurship in a textbook. And I think actually, yes, a lot of businesses were really surprised that not only from established startups, but we also had a stream for student and solo innovators in 36 hours that they solved problems that the company had for several years um, and leveraging technology, right? I think it's always really interesting. I, I, I love to hear you know, the talk. I love that statement about the next 10 years are going to out-innovate the past 100. Um, I also le early on learned that uh, our human brain is wired to think in linear terms and not, is not capable of thinking in exponential terms. So whenever I get the question about the crystal ball, I know that I'm going to be brutally wrong, uh, either in terms of what I imagine or in terms of the, the time and the speed in which things happen, right? Um, so, I mean, the short answer to your question is yes, of course. I mean, that is what startups are all about, right? If we take the definition that what differentiates a startup versus a traditional SME is leveraging technology to go faster and to go bigger, right, at, at a global scale. Um, if I look, I think, into, um, in terms of what is the most innovative, mind-blowing thing I've, I've heard, so, you know, passing on, you know, quantum computing, which, again, probably our human brain cannot fully grasp what this is all going to open up as, as opportunity, is really the most recent um, progress in terms of brain-machine interface. 
And I think that is one of the things where I'm just wondering if we talk about now, you know, uh, Zoom calls, working from home, or the example of, you know, going to the night market. Yes, I mean, today I'm just going to see photos of the night market, but tomorrow my brain is directly connected, potentially to somebody who has been at the, at the night market, who can download to me exactly how it smells, exactly how it feels, exactly how it vibrates. Um, I mean, I dream about going to planet Mars. I told my three little girls, you know, you're going to go into STEM because I want you to build a rocket ship and bring me to planet Mars. That's what I really want to do. Uh, well, tomorrow I may not need to do that because I can just connect myself directly to somebody who is sitting on planet Mars and I can exactly feel what the person is feeling because my brain is directly connected to any emotions that he has and, yeah, through, through technology. So definitely it's going to change the whole way we even work as human beings, the way we interact. Yes. You may not have to physically be there, but we're physically experiencing a lot of stuff. So that's something we have to think about in the future as well. I mean, the, the idea of traveling, the idea of just connecting is very different. Now, Gerd also talked about leadership as being a, an issue that we have to think about in the future. And I'm just curious from the three of you guys, like what qualities of leadership do you think are the most important? Dr. Charm, could you like let us know what, what quality of leadership is, is the top one? I think very important, particularly AI is going to take up a lot of routine jobs that Gerd talked about. I think creativity, definitely. And, but I think I mentioned that before diversity, but people used to work with somebody similar to them. But in this part of the world, I mean, we need to train our future new how we work together with diversity. Because there's a lot of um, paper talk about uh, innovation is actually directly proportional to diversity. That means if your team have more diverse uh, people from different backgrounds, actually you are more innovative. Innovative cannot be replaced by AI, at least for the next 10 years. So I think that is a very important thing. People work with different people and try to collectively, your innovation will be much higher. That's the only way you can guarantee you are still competitive in the market with all these AI, quantum computing, all that sort of coming. Yeah. Well, I mean, I totally agree. It's kind of like you know, baking a pie. The different layers of ingredients kind of makes a different layer of flavors as well in the whole pie. But we also talked about, or Gerd talked about earlier on about the non-routine concept. The more routine your job, the easier replaced by AI. Herbert, is that what you look in leadership? That someone who's able to kind of not be the typical ABC, ABC person? I, I think uh, for it, the, 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 the answer for the question would be different if you are saying in this few, day, few years or in the longer terms, right? Because uh, at this moment, when I talk to a lot of the CEO in the field, I find that uh, uh, there's a gap in between the knowledge that they already have and also the knowledge they how to translate the business problem onto a technology solution. Or the other way around, where I have uh, the, uh, you know, the technology solution, but I don't know what to fix. So the leader really need to bring all their uh, 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 people in the company all together and say, well, what direction are we going to, um, going to, right? Because that is actually something that we need to, we really need to change in order to be survive. So direction is very important. So that I know how to put my resources onto a different area. I'm working on a data field, right? So that you, the first question I always ask the CEO is that, do you know how much data you have? You know? And the second question is how much data has been using uh, to create value for your company. Do you have an uh, idea? I think 99% of the CEO don't have these uh, things in mind. So I think I'm just, not just talking about the data, but it's all other technology part where that um, the CEO won't be able to understand why it's so important. As like uh, 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 Toh just mentioned about the family uh, uh, company, right? Yeah. Type of company. They didn't really know what is the gap. If you don't know the gap, how can you know uh, the way uh, uh, in the, for the future? No, fair enough. I mean, a lot of times, I mean, I don't even know how many receipts I have in my wallet, let alone the amount of data we have. And that's an Like, Gerd, you talked about leadership. Could you share with us, like, what's the one uh, quality of leadership that you would say we should focus more on for the future? Oh, can hear. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, the one, one thing about leadership you definitely want is you want to be able to hear what they're saying as well when they're leaders. <laughs> that's a very important skill. I think that's yeah. what he's trying to portray to us. <laughs> yeah. Good, we can't really hear you. I'm trying my best to lip read, but I'm not that good with it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you read the lips? <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
maybe something got muted. That's okay. We'll give him a bit of time to work around. So that's another thing about leadership technology. Be very good at, at that. Nakarina, yourself, like if, if you, if you can see. Can you hear me now? Oh, there we yeah. go. Yeah, good, you're back. Yeah. Good to have you again. So yeah, leadership. Okay, sorry about. <laughs> sorry about this. So uh, <laughs> yeah, leadership without a microphone. That's good. So, uh, <laughs> basically, uh, basically, I think when we talk about leadership, true leadership, we, we're talking about a lot more soft skills and hard skills, right? I mean, Einstein once said, uh, famous uh, scientist, he said that um, uh, imagination is more important than knowledge. And I think when you talk about leadership, you talk about many things that are a complex scenario of many different things coming together. They're not like one intelligence, not one skill. Uh, and for example, if you're talking about, uh, let's say, compare Jacinda Ardern, mm. the prime minister of New Zealand, yeah, with other political figures, you could say, well, this, this woman has intelligence, IQ, but she also has EQ. She has other things that are about leadership. And I think when we talk about leadership, that has, it's, it's like, it's a development, like, like being a good musician, you know, you don't pop out being a good musician. You know, it, it, it's something that comes together. And, and this is something that we have to develop in our uh, team members, but also, uh, I think, in our children and in ourselves, and we have to groom that. It's like, you know, for example, if you're looking at great leaders uh, around the world, they also are great storytellers. Right? And how do you tell a story without truly having imagination and intuition? So one thing is knowledge, and the other thing is beyond the knowledge, which is kind of wisdom, right, parenthesis, right? So the great leaders have this, and this is something that we should strive for. It's also what makes us human. Right? Otherwise, I could say to the robot, why don't you decide you know, what we should do. Right? But the, mm. the reality is the robot doesn't know because it doesn't know what I need, right? It knows what the data needs. But so the combination of the two, I think, is a perfect scenario. Okay, well, thank you. I mean, let's move on. We have a question specifically for, for Herbert, actually. Someone says, is impact investments fulfilling UN sustainable development uh, goals a sector Sequoia has invested in? Do you have any examples? Can you say it again? I'll say it again. So there we go. The, uh, is impact investments fulfilling UN sustainable development goals? Is it a sector for Sequoia and have you invested in this sector? Uh, I, I haven't got any idea on, on, on that <laughs> no one. No data. <laughs> yeah, no data uh, for the motion. Yeah. Okay, no worries. I mean, we'll move it because there's a lot of questions. I'm very curious because like a lot of people have been talking about the. Well, actually, we made it. We made a thesis actually in terms oh. of when we built our entire conference startup impact summit um, based on the 17 UN SDG goals, where we said like if you look at you know today if you have companies that are purpose driven, mission driven on you know leveraging technology to solve some of the most pressing goals, actually all of the companies are in some way or the other really helping to drive the agenda forward. And the interesting thing is, you know, you have certain VCs that are really focusing 100% and declaring it as their investment thesis. And we had a very interesting talk about are these going to be companies that have a better return on investment or not? And I think there are a lot of, a lot of myths there still. And potentially, you know, again, some of the companies and countries that define what actually um, impact means, um, that define, like, for example, benefit corporations have more than just a short-term, um, really, uh, financial goal. And that, interestingly, very often in the longer term, uh, running after a certain purpose actually provides also better financial returns um, is, is really interesting. I think there is, there is still a lot that needs to be done. Um, I think there's also a lot that um, still uh, shows us as an opportunity can be further leveraged. Uh, but again, also some of the philosophy and the mindset, and you know, I always love to quote um, Simon Sinek and with his latest book about infinite games. So the companies that are really purpose-driven um, are the ones that are going to um, last longer and in the overall run going to perform better and provide also better financial returns. Okay, okay. I mean, well then, that leads me to another question, actually, because was talking. you were talking about companies trying to be innovative and trying to solve new issues. I mean, someone's asking, do you think humans will, in some sense, stop improving or modernizing technology to stop it from overriding us? Like, how much is, is too much of innovation? What do you think, Karina? Uh, well, again, so technology is just a tool, right? And I think actually Gerd said of himself, um, it, it becomes very ethical very often where we ask about is technology ethical, yes or no? It's not. You're not going to change humankind uh, through technology, right? So you can take tools and they are no much faster with much greater impact and you can always leverage them to do good things or you can leverage them to do bad things. And I think Gert really um, nicely 
uh, clarify that. Um, so to, to your question, if the question is technology is um, going to kill us, yes or no, no, it's still going to be humans leveraging technologies who are going to kill us or vice versa who are going to save us. <laughs> That's encouraging. I like that. Well, fair enough. I mean, we have a bit of time, actually. I just want to ask Gerd, because you talked about future navigation skills. I'm very curious, like, how, like, how are we able to improve our future navigation skills? Give some more, uh, concrete examples of that. You said, you know, one hour a day, but what do you mean by that? Yes, I hope you can hear me now. Give me a thumbs up. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> well, on the last question, just a quick comment on the last question. You know, Marshall McLuhan, the famous media theorist, says, uh, said, first we shape our tools and then our tools shape us. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and this is something that we have to keep in mind. It's not that simple. Whenever you, we extend, for example, if I'm going to go into virtual reality or connect my brain to the internet, I'm not going to be the same person. I always take, I take things away too. So, you know, when, when, we, when we extend, we also amputate, also Marshall McLuhan. We have to keep that in mind. Now, in terms of future-mindedness, you know, this is primarily a mindset. I always say the future is no longer about tomorrow. It's here. And the future is a mindset. Right? And that's what I'm looking for in people and entrepreneurs that I invest in. Do they have a future mindset? Do they understand what's next? Do they have intuition? Can they imagine? Can they imagine mostly right, hopefully, uh, to see where things are going right? and combine it with reality? So future readiness is really about saying, okay, I get a very good feel that this is going to be happening in five years or the next decade. And I work backwards from there and I come up with new ideas, right? So to develop the imagination. And I think this is the, the sign of intelligence, somebody from other scientists once said, is to have two opposing ideas in your mind at the same time which is to take care of today and to imagine tomorrow. Right? And that is something that we could train. So by saying, okay, right now, I'm not concerned about how this is going to turn into money or how I'm going to monetize it. I'm concerned whether it's valuable. My view really is because, you know, I've done a dozen startups or so myself. If it's valuable, if it creates a better situation for all involved parties, I can always find a way to monetize. <laughs> so I start with that question, you know, is it, the foresight question. And I think having foresight is so crucial now because, like I said before, we think of, think of the future as up there, some far away, but the future is here. And we are determining the future by our actions today. So therefore, foresight is becoming the new normal. All right, well, there you go. I mean, let's conclude. We have a couple of minutes. I just want to hear from our panels over here. Uh, in the next five years, five years from today, what do you think is going to be the most monetized, uh, valuable item in the future? Herbert, what do you think is going to be the one that's going to be everyone's focusing on in five years? I, I, I still uh, uh, stick on my, uh, my, my uh, area I just uh, mentioned. Uh, I think it's about cybersecurity and data security. As people going on this way, so they're more relying on the connectivity and also more relying on the trustworthy of data. Then you really need to have something to uh, to uh, to safeguard uh, um, um, all this. Uh, um, uh, Basically, emission. the lock. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What about yourself, Dr. Charm? The most valuable item in the, in five years from now. I'm glad you asked five years. If you ask <laughs> ten years, I don't know how to answer oh, it's you. Too far. <laughs> <laughs> I think definitely it's the human machine collaboration. I think for five years people are learning how to work with your digital colleagues, whether your bosses or subordinates. They probably are the robots. So which company or which individual can work closely and leveraging on the digital colleagues and, and you know, make their power much better, more intelligence? I think this next five years is going to be very interesting. What about yourself, Karina? Five yeah. years, that one item that's going to be the hardest thing. Yeah, I think actually what I hope will be the hardest thing, because again, it comes a little bit back also to um, the UN goals and in general, you know, leveraging technology. Does it really help us to drive inclusion, um, digital inclusion, financial inclusion, you know, inclusion access to, uh, uh, to education? And I think that will be a critical one, because what we want to avoid is um, that we see even further gap between, you know, technology becoming more powerful, more sophisticated, um, and still, you know, basic infrastructure missing in enough countries um, for not even having people being part of the game. So it is less a forecast, more than a true wish and hope. 
um, that this is something that we put on the forefront of, of the agenda. Because again, I think actually technology would give us the opportunity to be super closely connected all um, and fight hand in hand about the challenges that Gert nicely exposed to all of us. Um, but it's also easy to you know, let out and even widen the gap. Okay, so basically being able to share, connect with data, but also yes. being very safe about the data as well. Exactly. Now, Gerd, yourself, in five years, that one item that you're gonna, you think everyone's going to be talking and working on? Well, I mean, given the current circumstances, I think uh, anything to do with healthcare and biotechnology and making that, uh, that transition to a safer world better is clearly a priority. The second one, I think, you know, any technology having to do with climate change, addressing fossil fuel dependency, getting rid of fossil fuel, subsidies and so on and, and creating a, a, a totally circular society that to me is hundreds of millions of jobs lots of good outcome the best possible scenario that we can invest in together and i i'm, I'm really very bullish on this so I, I think that's the future well thank you very much for that and a huge thanks to our distinguished guests which include uh, gerd karina dr charm and herbert thank you so much for all of this and i believe our online audience as well. I hope I picked up some good questions and helped you get some answers as well. Of course, a special thank you to all our friends overseas who are fighting the night's sleep <laughs> with an extra cup of coffee. And that brings us to the official end of the online broadcast. I hope you enjoyed the event and please do support, up, support us in the upcoming live broadcast tomorrow. Now, before you go, though, fill out the questionnaire to let us know and hear your feedback. Take care and we'll see you in the future.